certainly for those of you who know me uh, well, this will not be brand new to you. Um, those of you who know me know that I have an, a real affinity for the use of photographs and for the use of audio flashcards with my patients. And I also find it ex extraordinarily useful in my work with couples. I tend to see primarily uh, couples where there are issues of narcissism. So these are high conflict couples, uh, often dealing with um, all, all kinds of traumas and, and crises and injuries, as Travis was dis discussing. What I, um, what I love about the use of these strategies is that I have found that it seems to help to enliven the process of producing empathy. And I do think it's my sense, my observation, is that the golden nugget for getting to feelings, to, for getting to forgiveness, for getting to healing and moving forward is first to have understanding, some sensibility about what's going on behind the scenes. So empathy is just that. It's a wisdom that comes in a felt form, an understanding that comes through our emotional resonance, through our, our interior world. We can feel the experience of the other. We walk in the shoes of the other. And so when I'm dealing with a, a difficult couple, you know, as a schema therapist, I think this is probably, I don't know, I think it's probably the hardest work to do is sitting with a couple where all these schemas are getting activated, these modes are flipping, with our couples. We are, we are caught in the chaos and the conflict and the challenge of doing this, although it's exciting and wonderful, and we have a model that can address this quite effectively. And um, so I want to just talk a little bit about this idea of feeling for healing, but feeling in the form of sensibility, understanding, empathy. It doesn't necessarily have to be agreement. Think about a couple where there has been an offense or an injury like an affair, and the injured party is hurt and wounded, and the injuring or offending party is defensive and feeling ashamed, perhaps, of the behavior that's occurred. And so you're caught in this, this posture where neither one is really capable of fully understanding and appreciating the experience of the other. And so just to, uh, to talk about it doesn't, in my experience, doesn't seem to be enough. I, I love pictures because I think they tell stories, they unlock memories, they engage emotions. And as I was talking about yesterday in my workshop on limited reparenting and self-disclosure, the picture tends to enable oftentimes my patients in going through photographs both together with me in the context of this particular presentation with their partner, as they're flipping through their photographs, they're reminded of some of the people in their lives that they may have forgotten who were there for them. They're reminded of experiences that may have been uh, painful, even joyful in their lives. And so we flip through photographs from childhood, through adolescence, through young adulthood, and together we will select photographs that we agree upon that are touching in some way, that touch or represent an experience of the child and the adolescent that we would call perhaps the vulnerable child, the lonely child, uh, the period of time in the child's life where they developed that construct or mode where they became detached, where they went into a more bullying or fighting back mode. And so we have some photographs that represent these different aspects, including a healthy adult. So when I'm working with couples, I have more photos than I might if I'm just working with the individual where I'm typically just holding on to the child photo uh, to engage those emotions. Also, the voice as a transitional object. You also know me as someone who really loves the audio flashcard over the written flashcard. I do think that when you put your voice, you know, in this day and age of technology, of smartphones and these wonderful little recorders that are smaller than this even, voice-activated recorders, you can record a two or three minute, one minute um, message to your patient to take home to listen to that keeps them connected to you, keeps them connected to the work, keeps them connected to some of the commitments that they're making in the treatment as they exit, because as we know, these well-formed habits and these very entrenched modes can fade very quickly as they exit the therapy session. And so I do, I have found, although it's not, you know, it's not 
it's not evidence-based in, in any formal way, but I have found in my own observations over many, many years of working with narcissists, they will listen to an audio flashcard. They will not read them as well as they will listen to them. And so, you know, I've wondered about that, if it's just because it's either, maybe it's more discreet, but in any event, um, we can coach, we can comfort, we can connect with the patient in doing this. Uh, we can provide a livelier attachment to us as this reparenting agent in their lives and carry them over in those mid-session days in between. And for couples, this can be very critical. I'm going to let you listen to just a short version of an audio flashcard that I made for a couple, something that they take home, something that they can use during periods of escalation or dysregulation in the relationship that we've discovered together in the session. Um, before I get into this couple, I just wanted to say something about um, about some of my uh, my favorite researchers in this area and why this has also become very fascinating to me. I, I, I've been reading um, a lot of the work and had the pleasure of meeting Marco Iacoboni, who worked with, uh, uh, I finally remembered the name, Alessandro, Shikamo Rizzolotti from Italy. And these researchers, um, in addition to... Um, uh, Kohler, and I'm forgetting the other name, were all involved in the laboratories looking at the macaque monkeys and really trying to understand mirror neuron structures. That region of the brain, I don't remember what, the F5 region of the brain, that looks at imitation, intention, and now can propose the probability of this neuronal area of the brain being attached to language and empathy, therefore understanding. The understanding of emotions that are portrayed in facial expression, in gesture. And think about voice tone. If you're watching a movie, if you're watching a scene, even if we're having a conversation, I'm looking at Kiara, I'm smiling, right? She looks at my, she knows this expression because she's had it herself. You've had that expression yourself. It's recognizable, it's within your memory, and therefore you can understand the, perhaps the intent behind my emotional expression, the intent conveyed in the tone of my voice in the words that I'm selecting to use because they're recognizable somewhere within your own memory. So when I'm working with couples, getting not only my voice on the audio flashcards, but their voices together to provide clarity of meaning. How often do we find that when couples are watching each other in a session and one goes like this and the other one turns like this, and immediately they are four frames ahead of what just happened because they're so used to this occurring in the relationship that there's a certainty about what that behavior represents. Oh, he's bored with me. Oh, he's not listening. Oh, he's had it. There we go again. I'm so fed up with this. And they're already four frames ahead, moving into maybe even a combative position at this point, and things can begin to deteriorate right then and there. And so uh, going back to the research, if, in fact, you know, the voice, you know, I see, how do they say it? I, I see what you feel. You know, watching a face, looking at the scans um, that they're doing right now in some of the research, looking at facial recognition on a scan and facial expression that gets registered and actually ignites the parts of the brain that allow us to appreciate that not only are we understanding intention, but we can actually feel the experience of the other feel the experience of the other. So the photographs provide opportunity for looking at the little face, perhaps, of a precious child who was hurt at one time, and then a story to accompany that. So as I sit with my couples in chair work, it's not infrequent that I'll have them take their photos and face each other and use the photograph, something like holding it up in front of the other, and even helping them to see how difficult it is to achieve a, a state of empathy when they're both in a child mode, or they're both in perhaps a coping mode, like a bullying mode, a protective mode of some type. So for example, one holds up the card and says, you know, in my world, there's the photo of a little child. In my world, as a little child, it was my responsibility to make sure that my mom's needs are getting met that she feels proud of me, that she can have a way to feel good about herself. That's my job in my world right now. And when I go to school and I get picked on by the children and I get abused by children in school, 
there's no one to tell. Because if I tell my dad, he'll think I'm weak. And if I tell my mom, then I hurt her feelings. And so my world is a world where I'm all alone. So they learn both back and forth to share with the photos in front of them that experience, to narrate their own story for one another. Usually what happens is one of two things. One will slip into a healthier adult mode and begin to feel some compassion for the other. Or they both stay locked in child mode, which helps them to see where their, where their struggle lies, where their suffering lies. The suffering of the relationship is the suffering that there's no one to attend to these hurting children that are being triggered. So the photographs can be very useful. And, and what am I doing? Well, I'm acting as the model for how they're going to learn to reparent one another. So I take care of each of the children, hoping and watching as they begin to evolve through the process. There's not enough time to go through this whole, uh, this whole treatment uh, that, I'm, that I'm doing, but helping them to get to the place where they can reparent each other, because that is our model in schema therapy with couples, is to teach the couple how to take care of one another's vulnerable child and help that child to evolve and to heal. So, for example, in the case of, um, and I love that expression, Travis used the expression feeling felt. You heard me talk about this yesterday. It's just one of my favorites that, you know, I stole. Maybe you did too from Dan Siegel. Um, it's just a wonderful expression of that quality of knowing that your partner is going out the door each day and what they carry in their mind about you is the true you and who you are. It's not the, oh my God, a pain in the ass that I have to leave behind. I've got to come home to this. Really walking out the door and carrying with them a true sense of the person that they love, the person that they understand, the person that they're, they're leaving for now as they leave. And so, you know, and it's the same quality, obviously, in the therapy relationship, that sense of feeling really attuned and understood and gotten, not just in the mind, but also in the heart and that intuitive sense of, of being known. So I think photographs can evoke an awful lot in the way of emotion. And, and it's not, this is not just about becoming all gushy and cathartic. This is about really trying to create emotional sensibility. It's not to let narcissists off the hook for bad behavior. It's a way of providing an explanation for how they went awry, how they stepped out of line. Understand a process. Be able to see where this comes from. Right, that there is a child underneath that you know, is suffering. And then there's another force in front of that. Maybe it's the bully. Maybe it's the show off. Maybe it's the one who needs a lot of attention, who governs the behaviors of this child, keeps this child hidden, secluded. Because the child is actually precious and, and maybe playful and wonderful. But she's never getting a chance to really get to know that part of her partner. So. Um, Again, it's just another way of bringing some life to all of this. And then using audio flashcards later to keep them connected to the treatment. So in this case, just briefly, uh, Charlie and Linda, um, he's entitled and jealous. He's on the narcissism spectrum. She's avoidant and self-sacrificing on the borderline spectrum. They've both been in individual and couples treatment. Um, I want to get to your mode map and just show it real quick, but, but uh, let me just do this first. So, you know, the photo discovery would look something like this. You know, he originally looks like this guy who's pointing the finger at you, so you've got this one who's upset and angry, but we know that, you know, below the surface what they're able to see as you show them is that there's also this adolescent who is, uh, who's hurting who's struggling, this little guy who has to perform and be perfect for everyone and get it right for his mom to, in service to her ego. And so we harness awareness of this. We harness awareness through being able to tell a story that's more pictorial and one that might be able to stay captured in memory because we're fighting really difficult habits that have formed over time. And in her, and another example is just the power of differentiation. So photos also help us to see that that was then and this is now. The power of implicit memory is such that so much is going on behind the scenes that we're not always aware that we're remembering when we're remembering. It feels so true, it feels so right, it feels so exact, and yet it's coming from another place deeper within. The flashcard helps us to ma maintain some momentum. 
you know, in those mid-session days. It also can keep motivation a little bit higher. We know that timeouts, most couples don't want to do them. Somebody's chasing the other one down. As soon as the other one says, that's it, timeout, you know, we're doing timeout. So I, I, I have found that we can make timeouts more meaningful if we give them something to do during the timeout. And I give them the audio flashcard to help them when they're anticipating a struggle or they get caught in the middle of a struggle and schemas get activated, that they have somewhere to go and something to do. These can be incredibly customized, personal for your couple, depending upon what you're working on in the moment. But again, it keeps sort of the purpose and uh, it goes something like this. You know, Charlie, you're listening to the flashcard right now, so clearly you've gotten triggered. Maybe this is a good time to take yourself to your, sp your safe space, you know, that room that you mentioned in the back with the piano in your writing desk, and sitting there for a moment and just close your eyes, make contact with little Charlie. You're feeling like you want to go into your caveman mode. Mostly it's that tension in your neck, those feelings in your body. You've picked up your cue. Good for you. Give little Charlie what he needs. And basically just guiding them as you, we would, and we've done this imagery exercise even here at the conference now a couple of times, helping him to close his eyes and make contact with the child. Because if the child is present, remember what happens. There's no one really taking care of the relationship. The children can't take care of each other. And so we, the child needs to be cared for. And if they're still in high conflict, if they're at the phase of treatment where the conflict is high, they don't have the capacity to give that to one another. So first they have to start with themselves. And then eventually they begin to give that, bring that to one another, not by saying, you're in your child mode now, but you know, maybe you need to take some time to take care of little Charlie. Or what does little Charlie need in this event? Sorry I didn't have time to share the mode map, but. You're going to hear about that from Eckhart in just a moment. So thank you very much.